the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 702 for Monday, March 26th, 2018. Ah, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. We are the show that you send in uh, your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. You send them in to us. Then we take it, we mix it all together, we share your answers, well, we share your tips and, and your cool stuff found and your questions, and we also share our answers, either that come from us or from the community or both or whatever. The goal, of course, is for each and every one of us to learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. And uh, and I'm going to tell you again about Ring at Ring.com slash MGG, where you can save a bunch of money on that stuff, too. Uh, for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, where it's really cold because I don't have any heat in my studio, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, where I'm experiencing a temperature of 63 Fahrenheit and 51% relative humidity. So I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, you're doing all right. Wish you were here. I, wish you yeah, were here. I wish I was there right now, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Just, yes, uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut. John F. Braun. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, no, John F. Braun, it is um, I, my, I think actually, in fact, I know because my nest told me. So this is really interesting. I woke up this morning. And I got an email from IFT uh, because I had set up IFT, I-F-T-T-T, to tell me when my Nest thermostat reports the temperature being below 50 degrees here in the studio. And I realized, of course, that I should probably set it to tell me when it's below 55 or 54 because I normally have it set at 57 in here when I'm not in the room. So if it gets any below like 55, something has gone wrong. And sure enough, in looking at the Nest's logs, it thinks it's been heating the studio nonstop since about 6 a.m. yesterday morning. So clearly things it worked at like 4 a.m. And then after that, it stopped working. Um, and it's the for those of you that care, it's the inducer motor basically ate itself to death um, and won't spin the fan anymore. And thankfully, my heating boiler is working appropriately because it won't try and light if it's not getting any draft, which is good because otherwise you know, bad fumes and, you know, blow up the house kind of thing. So, um, so they got here too late to put that in today, but, uh, hopefully tomorrow, but very cool that if let me do that, right. Because otherwise, it, I mean, I would have figured it out maybe an hour or two later, but, uh, but now I've actually said it, like I said, at 54 so that it, it won't take as long for me to have to realize this, but pretty cool, you know? Well, you know, Dave, I'm going to offer a premature cool stuff found. Okay. Because I have a tool that will tell me exactly when this sort of thing is happening. Okay. And it's called the Thermo Peanut. It's a tiny little device, has a battery, yeah. it uses Bluetooth, and it has an app. And it's basically a, a temperature logger, but it has a feature where if the temperature goes above or below. Sure. And I, I do this. So I, I think I set it for 55. If it goes below 55, then maybe something's wrong. Maybe not, because sometimes I, I keep yeah. it low uh, in the winter. But um, it's proactive. The only thing is that it's Bluetooth, so you have to be on the premises. And your phone probably has to have the app running in the background, too, right? Uh, I think I have it set to, yeah, to query it. Okay, got it. So, got it. Cool. But, um. But it's good for that because, yeah, I mean, I've had it come up sometimes saying, okay, you're on an edge condition here. Uh, just thought you'd like to know. Yeah. But it's nice. So in this case, it, it thought the thermostat was on, but because the device it was connected to wasn't working, that led you astray. Well, no, it didn't lead me astray because my my if sensor is actually – it's it's better than what you would get with a the thermal peanut because it doesn't require me to be on site. So the Nest thermostat both is able to be an action – so I can have the the nest tell it to like set the temperature, but it can also be a trigger. So uh, I have it. I have ift reading it, you know, as a just because it's just it is just a thermometer as well. 
And so IFT reads that thermometer data. Oh, okay. And when it saw that it was at 49 degrees, it sent me an alert, which is what I told it to do. And like I said, now I've set it to tell me when it's 54 because, you know, like, <laughs> it didn't need to go a full day. And in fact, if I had figured it out yesterday, it would be fixed by now. So there you go. But um, I have been so while we're on this subject, let, let's just stay here for a second, because uh I, you know, th those, those ring doorbells, it, they aren't officially a sponsor of, of this episode, but they, they're doing a sort of a long-term sponsorship and those ring doorbells really kind of opened or ring stuff. Cause it's the doorbell and the floodlight really have kind of opened my eyes on the smart home thing. And it's been very, very cool. And as I mentioned in the intro to the show, like just cause they're not a sponsor of this episode, they, they're, um, their deal still works. Ring.com slash MGG saves you a fortune on some of this stuff. And it's really cool stuff. And it sets up super easy. Like I've never done a home improvement project that has set up as easy as the ring stuff. They think about this stuff. Like when I was hanging the floodlight, um, you know, you got to be up on a ladder. And when the time comes to connect the wires, you know, because you got to connect the wires from your old floodlight to the ring. Uh, you know, you got to hold the, you got to hold the, the, the ring floodlight in one hand, and then you need to take your other two hands and twist those wires together. But if you're like me, you've only got the two hands. So what ring thinks about in the box is like, there's a little hook in the, uh, in the instructions say, grab the hook that's in the box, hook it on the bracket that you just installed and on the, the floodlight cam. And then it hangs there. And now you can use your, your two hands to twist the wires together. And then you throw the hook away when you're done. Very cool stuff. But that has kind of opened my, my eyes here, John, to, you know, to a lot of this smart home stuff. So this weekend I had a home Depot Depot gift card from, from Christmas time. And oh, I, love those things. I know. And so I thought, all right, I want, well, dude, they got all the toys. I I've noticed yes. and, and yours probably is that they have, all of the nest that the, they have, the, all of the advanced, I, I would say the, 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 the toys that you and I like. Totally. Well, they're like, gee, where can we sell this? And it'd be like, well, Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, um, you know, other national chains. Yeah. And, uh, but I love going there because, you know, I never thought I'd love going to Home Depot, but it's like their electronics section. It's and home, awesome. Yeah. Home section. They, they got all the good stuff. So, it's totally um, true. Continue. No, no. So I, I was like, all right, we're going to do this because I want... You know, I've got uh, two lights at my front door and then I have a light at my we've got like a lamppost in the driveway. And then I have a light just outside of the front door, for lack of a better term, of the building that has my office and the, and the podcast studio in it. And I want those all those lights fully automatable and I want them to be full color. And I figured, all right, I got this, you know, $100 Home, Home Depot gift card. That's going to put a huge dent in a nice set of, of you know, uh, smart lights that'll do any color. And and so at Home Depot, they charge 200 bucks for the Philips Hue full color four bulb set. And it was like, great, that's only 100 bucks for me today. Done. So I set those up. Lucas and I, my son and I set those up yesterday. And... um. And we got them working and it's cool because I can have the lights come on at sunset and then go off at like midnight or whatever. And then I'm like, all right, but here's the thing, because midnight's about when we go to bed. I want like if somebody drives in the driveway, my ring door, uh, not well, the doorbell won't see him unless they come to the front door. And that's different. But my floodlight cam in the driveway will see him. So I want when that senses something in the driveway, I want it to turn on the two lights that are around the driveway, the lamppost and the one at the office. And so, but I only want it to do that at night. And then I only want it to be on for five minutes. So I started digging into IFT and their IFT is very feature limited. Like there's no way that I can tell to have, have like conditional triggers. Like if this, like it can turn on the lights when the, when the ring sees activity, but it can't only do it at night. And it can't then set a timer and turn it off five minutes later, right? Or 10 minutes, whatever, you know, whatever you want. So I'm like, all right, IFT isn't going to do this. I start looking and looking. And then I remembered running into a company called Stringify, John. And Stringify lets you create very complex uh, home automation scripts, for lack of a better term, but it's all very visual. You, you just drop things in and link them all together. So now 
I have actually I have two. They call them flows, but I have two of these flows in Stringify. And one of them is, uh, you know, if there's motion detected from the ring and it's between 1201 a.m. and 6 a.m. So, you know, it's dark out. Then turn on the lamppost light at 100 percent brightness. Turn on the office light at 100 percent brightness and start a five minute timer. And then after the five minute timer, I have it set. Turn off the lamppost, turn off the office light. And I tested it earlier today. I just changed the, the clocks because, you know, why not? And uh, it totally works. It's like it's brilliant. But I could have it go like I could have it set it to be red or something. So it's not so bright and blinding in the middle of the night. But um, but there you go. And, and you know, the thing is, like you can do if all your devices were home kit compatible, which ring uh, is not currently, but uh, the hue bulbs are, but most everything else I have is not. In fact, I think the hue bulbs are the first thing that I have that's home kit compatible. My Nest thermostat's not. My Ecobee is the first version, so that's not. But you can do some level of this automation with home kit if your devices are all home kit supported in that I could have it turn if there's a sensor from a home kit compatible camera and it's nighttime, like you can then have that do an automation, but it won't start the timer for you. It won't do any of that stuff. So Stringify is like my new favorite thing for this stuff because it's totally custom. The, like the fact that I can have it like run a timer for me is really cool. You know? Yeah. So what's a, what's, what's their, a, what do they get out of it? I don't. What does Ift get out of it? I don't know. Like I, that's a very good question. Well, that's the the open source movement, so they they get the satisfaction of. All right. Well, then that's that, then right. then there's Ift, right? I mean, then then the same with Stringify. I mean, it's no different. Change it's, your life by connecting everything. I, it's cool. I don't see how you cannot support that. I mean, mm hmm. So the thing well, that I mentioned, Skynet. the thing that I mentioned where I have Ift notifying me when my Nest thermostat gets low or whatever, I could easily have Stringify do that too. Uh, I just haven't, you know, I, I, I still have a bunch of stuff in Ift and just these. And then I made a trigger for the, the doorbell. If it senses that, then it should light up the uh, lights, uh, you know, around the front door. Because why not? It's pretty cool, man. I'm I'm pretty stoked about this. So. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I, I may be uh, deploying this in, in the near future. Yeah. Since, uh, I highly recommend it. It's free. Like, like you said, I mean, it, there doesn't seem to be a, I, I don't know what the, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they get money from the device vendors, but I don't think they do. I think it's just like a platform. So it's cool though. It's pretty awesome. Um, Shall we stay with the cool stuff found? Uh, let's stay with the cool stuff found idea because Stringify sort of fits into that. And uh, and we have something from listener Tony. And Tony shares with us. He says, hey, guys, back in Mac Geek Gab 693, uh, in the discussion about external displays and mirroring, Dave mentioned the shame of a messy desktop shared with an audience when setting up a presentation. There is an inexpensive, less than $5 or about $5, tool that hides all the items on the desktop and changes the desktop to anything you'd like. For example, a solid color or maybe an image relating to the topic of the presentation. Just a little extra touch to put some polish on your presentation. This is especially useful if you're demoing things in the OS rather than using presentation software. Kill the app and your comfy, messy desktop is back. And it's called Desktop Curtain. It's from ManyTricks.com. ManyTricks, uh, one of the partners there is Rob Griffiths, who years ago started Mac OS X Hints. So, uh, so definitely uh, good folks over there. But uh, yeah, check it out. Desktop curtain. So thanks for that, Tony. Good stuff, man. And got any thoughts on that, John? I hate a messy desktop. Do you? Do you? Is your desktop messy or do you keep your, your desktop? Pruned? Oh, no. Uh, uh, CS, so yes, unlike some, and I always cringe when I see this and it's mostly new users because uh, they don't know any better. Don't make your assumptions. But everything is on their desktop. Like I literally in the desktop folder. Oh, I see what you like. Documents and everything are stored on the desktop. Every, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, not not just that, but everything. <laughs> so, 
desktop <laughs> and it's so cluttered. I'm much more structured. I put all my stuff in my documents or, or put it in the appropriate higher level or, or folder within your user folder. Uh, Brian Monroe suggests, he says, why not use spaces? And he, it, because he says, wouldn't mm -hmm. that do the same thing? And this is in our chat room at com slash stream. Um, you're right. It would. I don't I, like spaces in me. I, I don't know. It's just not my thing. But you're right that that would that would be a great way to sort of tackle this particular issue. So I, I might I might actually do that for presentations, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Very, very good. All right. Uh, we have not one, not two, but I think three. Oh, we have two audio cool stuff found. It stuff's found. And then one, uh, I think we've got another tip later on that's uh, also audio. But we'll go to the cool stuff's found now with Daryl and see if I can make this work. Hey, John and Dave. This is Daryl. I've got a pick that I thought I'd share. And this is uh, Just Press Record. It's a cool little voice memo app that works both on the phone and on your Apple Watch. So you can actually record right from the Apple Watch. It syncs those recordings through iCloud Drive, so I can grab them from my Mac if I want to do that too. But the other cool thing that it does is voice transcriptions as well. So pretty cool, and I'm actually using the Apple Watch to record this one. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like that. That so sounded reasonably good. It sounded <laughs> spectacular. Yeah. I wasn't like, oh, this is on a watch. Ew. That yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good, man. Huh. All right. I like it. A transcription. Now, there we go. Well, that's right. Right. Because uh, because we were talking about transcription stuff. And uh, and so there's just press record. But then we were asking in the last show about adding captions to your videos. And we got an answer, you know, and from none other then the esteemed Dr. Mack himself, uh, Mr. Bob or Dr. Bob Levitis. Now, what you're not going to uh, it's an audio comment, but actually it's a video comment. You're not going to see a video because we don't do video here. Maybe we should. Um, but uh, but what Bob says in this was overlaid on a video and it's actually a video he took while he was walking. So, uh, so he took it on his iPhone and then it, it just put these captions in, but I'll let Bob tell the rest of the story. The answer, my friend is not blowing in the wind. Dot, dot, dot. The answer is this free iOS app called Clipomatic. Period. <laughs> I guess that's it. There you go. Thanks, thanks, Doctor Bob. Very, very cool stuff. Wow, hear him working out there. Well, yeah, he was walking. You know, he was doing his thing. But, but yeah, the the text appeared on the video right there. So there you go. Clipomatic answers that question from seven hundred one. So very, very good stuff. We'll put that. We'll put that in the show notes, obviously, because that's what we do. Oh, by the way, he's not a real doctor. As far as you know, he's not a real doctor. <laughs> That's right. I haven't seen any certificates or other <laughs> documents that prove as much. So That's right. That's right. Do you get those so when you I'll go to your be... doctor, though? Like, have, like, how many of your doctors that you've gone to have you said, whoa, whoa, dude, like, cough up the certs first, then let's talk about whatever we need to talk about. Um, I mean, it's possible you've seen fake doctors. I don't think you have, to be, no, to be honest. No, 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 I think. I don't know. No, I don't think I have. I don't think so. No, they either put the, the they put the stuff on the wall. Yeah, they're and, supposed and to. And it's local institutions that I recognize, so I, I trust them. But yeah, not not like Mickey problem. Mouse schools or whatever. Not like that. What was that That movie, Bad Medicine, where uh, it was like the, the Mexican medical school or something, and they called them Mickey Mouse school, so they had weekly fine. The, never mind. Here we are. Uh, I am using something different for this episode. Uh, we live stream, of course, to MacGeekGub.com slash stream, as I have mentioned many times. And we used to use a tool called NiceCast. And really all we used NiceCast for was to sync my computer here, which has the sort of the final mix of the audio in real time. It would send that to an IceCast server that 
I have running on our server that runs like Mac Observer and a bunch of other backbeat media sites and all those things. And I just have Icecast running there. And so whenever anybody, whenever you connect to MacGeekUp.com slash stream, you're connecting to that server and getting it from there. And that acts as kind of a relay. So I needed some way to get the audio to that server. And uh, Rogue Amoeba's Nicecast did that. And it still would do that, but they announced that it was being end of life because it couldn't easily be converted from 32 bit to 64 bit. They made some decisions, you know, decade plus ago about how to incorporate audio stuff. And those decisions leave that particular app firmly seated in the 32 bit world. They'd basically have to rewrite it from scratch. And they say there's not enough of a market for them to do that. Um, so. Nicecast also would have let me set up a server right here. Um, thankfully, I don't need to do that because I set it up elsewhere. Uh, but I am using a different app now to do that same relaying. And it's called, I, I believe I'm pronouncing it the way it's supposed to be pronounced, Ladiocast, L-A-D-I-O-C-A-S-T. And uh, and that lets me take the audio and relay it to our, our Icecast server. And it seems to work great. And honestly... I haven't been hearing any of those interesting little audio hiccups that I wouldn't get with any other podcast I recorded, but I would get with this one, John, which tells me it started telling me that maybe Nicecast because of its 32 bit stuff was the reason because this is the only show that I use Nicecast for. So, no. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, no, it's not your fault. No, because all the other shows are basically the same, like Gig Gab and, and Small Business Show. Well, I mean, in terms of like we use Discord, we use it's the same setup. Um, technically other than uh, we didn't do live streaming, but so I haven't heard any, you know, I should be knocking on wood or something. This is the door opening, which is really good news because it means a space heater. Are you getting heater, a space heater? A space heater has arrived. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Everybody says hi, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Where Lisa, say plug hi. In. I think it's got a plug in over there. Uh, you. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Does she want to luck with that? Sit in or uh, no? You gonna sit in on the show, Lee? Uh, no. No. Okay. So, uh, so Ladyocast seems to be working well, including live streaming Lisa's setup of our our space heater here. <laughs> so this is great. Sweet. Now it's um, it's probably gonna be like 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 eight hundred degrees in here. Like yeah, I'm gonna be <laughs> ten minutes. Yeah. So I'm sitting on a heating pad, not because my back hurts, but because it, yeah, I'm gonna be complaining about how hot it is. But yeah. Hey. There you go. All right, cool. Well, hopefully it doesn't make a lot of noise. And if it does, we'll, I'll turn it off. Is it elect? Huh? Make noise? All right. Well, it's, it's got to have a little fan in it to blow across the thing. Ow. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, that I actually, I have Brian Monroe to thank for this because when, uh, <laughs> when I, when I mentioned pre-show that Lisa was going and getting these space heaters, um, he's like, oh, you should have her bring it into the studio. I thought, yeah, of course I should. I hadn't thought about it. It wasn't my idea. So I saw her request on Facebook and I was tempted to uh, reply, but mm, there you go. You got a better offer. <laughs> so I will ask you folks in the chat room to let me know if you hear the space heater making any, any background noise for me. So we'll, we'll do that. So yeah, no, of course we'll leave this in the show. It's good. Uh, so that's, that's Ladyocast. That's that particular cool stuff found. And while we're on the Cool Stuff Found bandwagon, I want to talk about our uh, our sponsor for today, if that's okay with you, Mr. Braun. Outstanding. Awesome. So our first sponsor for today is Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. Um, they wanted us to let you know that they are now shipping their new Thunder Bay 4, Thunderbolt 3 external drives. Uh, those things are super cool. These are, I mean, it's, first of all, it's Thunderbolt three. I, I love the fact that they keep up to date on all this stuff. They know how to use all this stuff, but the Thunder Bay four super fast. It's a four bay unit for lack of a better term that you Thunderbolt into your Mac and of course plug into power and you can put in three and a half inch or two and a half inch drives into this. And then you, it's a, it's a, it's a bunch of discs is what it is, but you can use soft raid with it, or you can use Mac OS's built in raid. You can use basically, you know, whatever you want and software raid, including soft raid, really is in many ways better than hardware raid because it 
it allows the raid to be controlled by something that understands what the operating system is doing. And that's huge because if you get some right interruption or you get some interruption with the raid, if it's hardware raid, the unit has no idea what the operating system did or didn't do before that raid went down. So it has to do a much more exhaustive rebuild in order to be certain that everything's okay. Whereas with software raid, the operating system knows exactly what it was doing. It knows when the raid went off and it can use that information to be very intelligent and rebuild way, way faster. Uh, it's also using the CPU on your computer and today's Macs all have CPUs with the uh, hardware instruction set for RAID built into them. So it's super efficient. Really cool stuff. you got to check out this Thunder Bay 4. It's, um, if you need direct attached storage, this is really something worth considering. Um, you know, and, and then for anything else you need for your Mac, either other external drives, if you need RAM, you need an SSD. Uh, they, you know, they understand these products. They've been Apple fans for longer than we've been doing this show. Like they've been in business way longer than we've been doing this show, like perhaps even twice as long. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but close to that. If it's not that you want to check these folks out, go to Mac and, uh, and check it out. And, and all they ask is that you check it out. That's it. Uh, if you want to let them know that you heard about them from us, that's even better, but you don't even have to just let, uh, just go check them out. Mac sales.com our thanks to, Max Sales and Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, Mr. Braun. Mm -hmm. You want to take, oh, let's go to, let's go to John. Uh, listener John. Oh, yeah. John, guys, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, listener John asks the age old question. Um, he says, I recently wiped my hard drive, iMac 5K, with a 3.1 terabyte Fusion drive and did a restore from my carbon copy clone or clone. The drive held or had about 1.3 terabytes of data on it before the, I wiped. After I restored, the drive shows that it has 2.9 terabytes on it. Any ideas about why? So I take this and abstract it out to being the age old question that we all ask at least once a year, probably a couple times a year. What is on my drive and why is my drive almost full? Right. And so mm -hmm. I, 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 we can get into a conversation speculating specifically what might be going on with John here, but really, frankly, there's just no reason to speculate, John. And I, I say that actually to both of you, you and listener, John, uh, because you can find out, uh, there is a lot. Of, there are a lot of tools out there that will answer this question for you. I like Omni Disk Sweeper. Uh, it's old, I know, but I like. I know how it works. Oh, no, but they updated it. Actually, they. That's true. It. It's it, they did update it. If that's you've dabbled right. with it lately, I noticed this. They're like, hey, no, yeah, this right. works with APFS. That's right. Yeah. So I'm happy. I think it's still in beta state, but no, because I was looking at it as well to help a listener solve a problem, and it's yep. like. They're like, oh, yeah, you, you probably want the beta if you want this to work on APFS. Right. Like, okay. <laughs> That's right. I forgot that I had downloaded the beta of it. That's, That's right. That's pretty much what they said is like, uh, it's not going to work. Yeah. And then uh, if you don't want Omni Disk Sweeper, there's Daisy Disk and uh, at daisydiskapp.com. And then also Sierra and later will show you uh, uh, uh. some of this stuff in the disk space analyzer. Right. If you go to Apple about this Mac, oh yes, storage. oh I'm gonna I'm gonna shake my fist because well we have a question that's on deck. Okay, and okay. I shake my fist at their measurement tool because well, yeah, because it's I not believe, complete. Well, I believe parts of it, Dave. Honestly, lie, and okay. I can give you documented proof. In All right, certain calculations that that tool does are wrong. Well, let's we'll go to that one next for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think it's on the agenda, but uh, is it on the agenda? Fine. All right, good. We'll we'll, we'll jump to no, it. No, it was weekend. the it was the mystery. Yeah, we had another question. All I mean, right, cool. A, yeah. It's on the list, but the thing is, I found that Apple's tool is unpredictable. How about that? For certain measurements, it gave me wildly varying values. All right, so don't but use Omni Apple's tool. Use Omni Disk Sweeper. It's free. There you I, go. I and I yeah. totally trust their estimation of 
I will or say the, their measurement because but when you yeah yeah the thing he's got to launch you, you know we we got the article he got to launch it using pseudo so it sees the system stuff because a lot of times it's system stuff that's taking up all the space and it's like what that's right we have yeah and we'll link to an article that shows you how to um how to run how to run Omni Disk Sweeper using from the you have to launch it from the terminal using uh, sudo s u d o so that it runs as root and that way it can see everything that root can see and you'll be able to see what's going on on your drive. Uh, before we jump to your piece about um, about how Apple's thing is wrong because I I want to go through that. But um, did you have anything you wanted to sort of speculate with why this is happening to John's drive in particular or is that not? you tell me um i mean the thing is we've seen dis differences in the amount of space reported by the finder versus various other tools i'm just kind of percolating on this mm. because the thing is sometimes the, the like caches and local backups and there are certain things and i'm almost certain there's an apple support article which i don't have at the tip of my fingers right now but there are certain things that are stored but are not used in certain space calculations. Now, the size of this just makes me think that that's probably not the case. It's probably not a local backup or one of these other things that flies under the radar when it measures space. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it can't be a cache. I mean, how can you be caching that? Yeah, I'd be curious to know. I, like I said, it's, it's you know, the, every minute that you spend speculating, um, if you're not already I mean, letting Omni Disk Sweeper run on your Mac, you just, I mean, it's I mean, just The only thing I'll throw time. out here is I, I have noticed as of late with my devices is that a lot more space is being taken up by iOS device backups. And I'm using iStat uh, Mini. Um, yeah. which I think does historical. And then sometimes they turn out to be because, you know, I'm doing photos and all that stuff. They turn out to be gigabytes sometimes. Sure. <laughs> um, that's the only thing off the top of my head you may want to look at is that, you know, are you backing up way more? But then Omni Disk Sweeper, the other tools we told you about, I'll tell you that. But that's the thing I've noticed as of late with my setup, Dave, is all of a sudden I'm like, well, you know, I lost a couple hundred gigs. It's like, where's that going? It's like, oh, it's going to ios backups okay yeah right it's, yeah exactly oh yeah it could yeah yeah but still it, you're not going to lose terabytes to that at least not overnight oh no no of course not yeah huh I hope. yeah i'd be curious so listener john if you uh if you want to share back with us we would we would appreciate it um where what what uh what question do you want to take us to john that that sort of digs deeper into this is it on the agenda or, or not or do you just want to share your your thoughts about this um i'll just share the thoughts okay cool um just my observation and then yeah. maybe we can dig in a little more here because i think our listener is going to get back to us so okay basically the gist of the problem was all right if i go to uh if you go to the apple menu about this mac and then you uh you know, you get your ver various tabs up there. You can go to storage. Sure. And storage will show you a view of your disk. It'll tell you how much is available and how much is uh, total space. And right now mine is saying calculating, but then there's also a manage button. And let's see what that tells us. And this is the problem that I had, Dave, is that so a listener wrote in and we're, we're still kind of tossing this one around here. And he's like, well, all right, so I see all these categories on the left. So it shows you applications, documents, blah, blah, blah. But then at the bottom, it shows you something called system. Okay. And at least on my mini right now, Dave, it shows 100 up. Ah, all right, and this is why I shake my fist at it. So while I was looking, Dave, it said 150 gigabytes. Okay. Are used for something called system. While I was watching it live, Dave, it just went from 150 to 10. And I had the same result on my MacBook Pro in that it showed 200 gigabytes used up by something called system. And then it went to 10 or 20. And I'm what? like, what? Exactly. And then if you dig in deeper, and we will, I promise. Because it's what we do. Well, no, but they say if you look in the help and sometimes you go, you'll find these little nuggets in help. It's like, oh, well, syst well, that system category that you see at the bottom you know, bottom of the screen there, that's content 
from Apple apps like mail and, f- and I'm like, what? No, it's not. I don't even know what it is, Dave. Cause the problem is if you click on the other things on the left hand side, when you bring up this diagnostic screen, it shows you the content and how much space it takes up. You know, which one doesn't do that? The system category, you click on it and it doesn't tell you what it considers system content. So, huh? I, so it lies. I hope you're looking at that screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm on a yeah, I'm on a um I mean I'm on Sierra, but but yes, it it it's just it's still spinning on system for me here. So And that the, the, the so that's one thing happened. <laughs> and another is that I've seen the size of it change from a huge number to a little number, and it's like so. Huh. Yeah. At least one Listener wrote in and said, I can't migrate from, I, I don't believe I can migrate from this system to another system, which has a smaller hard drive, because it claims there's 700 gigs of system stuff. Of to stuff. Move over. Yeah. And I told him the same thing. I'm like, well, run Omni Disk Sweeper and see where this, the hundred of gigabytes must be concentrated somewhere. And Apple's not going to tell you where because of their choice not to tell you <laughs> right right yeah exactly huh that baffles me it's like why in the ui for this feature dave do they not show you the contents of the category like every other item in that list and i don't know i don't know that's weird man yeah i mean i've never really looked here and i i, I probably know why because it lies <laughs> right because it lies I'm sorry yeah yeah no i uh, saw it happen like, like, right it, it just went to 7.32 it was ten. Now it's seven. What happened? I I I, I don't know. But yeah, don't that's. Me. I mean, that's Apple, crazy. Please, I beg of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. I don't have an answer, but I have lots of questions. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot of problems with you people. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, you know, Frank Costanza. Uh, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> it's not Festivus yet, though, but it it could be soon. So I am airing my grievances right now. Oh, that's that's true. Uh, Michael writes in and asks, he says, I keep getting the sign in request on one iPad mini with an up to up to date iOS that says sign in required. Enter the password for and then it lists his Apple ID. You can type Hmm. in the password or, you know, hit cancel or continue being skeptical. I just hit cancel. And so far, everything seems to work. Okay. Email iCloud. Everything seems okay. Is there any way to determine what is asking for this? Is it malware? I hope I haven't missed you explaining this. No, we haven't gone through this in at least not in a while. Um, I've seen this certainly on my instinct. Yeah, it it is a good instinct, but I don't think this is malware. I have seen because it's showing his Apple ID and it's coming up with that iOS password thing. And he's not in a web browser. He's, you know, actually he sh- it shows the audible app running in the background. I, I think this is a legitimate request. It happens a lot. Um, I've, I, I think the credential cache expires for various Apple services. I don't just want to say iCloud services, but for various Apple services um, and it needs a re-login. Sometimes I've seen it tell me why it needs this, like FaceTime messages, you know, sometimes it's iCloud, um, but it, I, I've seen it happen and it's normal and yeah, you just need to log in. So you might not be seeing an issue with your email, your iCloud, but FaceTime might not work the next time you try it, or your messages might get foobarred up or whatever. Brian Monroe in the chat room is saying that he's seen it. And uh, he believes that at least at some points in time, what has caused this is Apple moving your iCloud data from one data center or server to another. So uh, that certainly could be a trigger, too, because it would be the same kind of thing. Like you were credentialed for one thing and now you need to, you know, you need to have those credentials refreshed. So I wouldn't worry about it. I, I just type it in and move on. There you go. And it can be very confusing because it sometimes after you type in your password, it'll ask you right away. Again, and it's again because you've got, you know, email, uh, 
iCloud and email usually are the same thing, but then messages is separate, FaceTime separate. So you can sometimes have to answer this several times. And I know you're, you're, I hear you, you breathing and, and huffing and puffing. So go. I'm just breathing. Okay. Oh, I thought, I thought there was. Well, no, the only thing concerns me. So number one, it certainly could be a phishing attempt. So phishing is presenting. Uh, no, a, I, I want to stop you there. I, 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 what th this is using Apple's login thing. It's not a web page. It's not an email asking. This is Apple's like prescribed pop up that comes up over everything else that is asking for a sign in and it lists your Apple ID. Okay. It is I definitely just, not. I'm fishing. looking at the screenshot and, and it, I don't recognize the app asking for it, but it says sign in. Right? No, it looks it looks legit. It's legit. Yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, it, the app. But that's behind this is audible uh, in right. his screenshot. But um but it's asking okay. for his and Audible Apple ID. Will probably ask for Apple credentials. Okay. Um, no, I don't see any reason why Audible would ask for Apple credentials. Uh, or somebody I, is. Yeah, I think it's or the it's system a, asking for this. Okay, so Audible has nothing to do with this. Correct. That's just what was there? It just okay. happens to be. What you know, what was be there. swell yeah. is if they put because the thing is, I mean, it's pretty trivial to forge. I mean, you know, I can run Apple tools and make a dialogue that looks like this, and and. Nobody will know. It'd be nice if they had kind of like other websites, like a little lock or a little, you know, something mm. to make you feel better that you're not being hoodwinked. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you know I, what I'm saying? I, I totally agree with you, except the, your lead into that statement was you could easily forge this. And the answer to that is false. You could not easily forge this. But well, not from Audible, but from a Web page, you could from a Web, I mean, a web page, page you could, could easily right throw up one of these because it, it could it would have to know your apple id in order to put that in there but in order for it happening during audible talk i i, I agree with you yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah a system thing unless somebody's forging the audible site too which yeah in which, in which case you got bigger problems no i okay. don't think i I've, I've never i've never heard any reports of this being uh nefariously you know, yep. created. But that said, I'm totally with you that, that this should, there should be a thing that you could tap on and say, why, first of all, tell me why you, you want this information right. for me. And also confirm to me that you are my iPhone asking for this or my iPad asking for this, not some phishing attempt or something. Cause you're right. It just cause we know that you can't forge it this way. doesn't mean that that's universal knowledge. Of course it's not universal knowledge. Apple needs to do a better job with this. But yeah, it is, it is, it is safe when you see that, that Apple dialogue, but even though it doesn't say so, it's an Apple dialogue. Though you, yeah. So making it clear, which they do more often on the Mac, I think, but, um, yeah, but the thing that gets me is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a fish shake here, a little fish shake, but you, you talk, you just address the issue of apps seemingly randomly asking you to sign in again and it's like and for most of us it's like dude not again not again <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i just told you what my pat you should be able to uh, i think the expectation of most users is once i give it to you i mean maybe as a security measure every couple of months you ask for it again but the thing is not every time <laughs> right right no it just got anytime i run an app that i know Wait, I just used it like a day ago, and it's like, well, what's your user and pass? I'm like, well, I just told you. Why don't you remember? So Brian Monroe points out that uh, mm. a web page could create this type of dialogue. Um, and so uh, best if you do not um, answer these type of pop-ups if it's uh, if, if the, if the active app is your, is your web page, there you go. I, I like, but otherwise if it's coming up over your home screen or over another app that that's not a web browser, then yeah, no problem. So, mm -hmm. um, I, 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 while we're on the subject, I, I do have a quick tip to, to share for whatever reason, I realized that. On all but one of my Macs, I was not seeing SMS messages appear in my messages app on the Mac. 
And that's using something called text message forwarding, right? Is how that works. Um, and if you go on your iPhone into settings, messages, text message forwarding, you'll see it'll list your devices and you can turn it on and off. And it's super handy because that way you can just have text message conversations, regardless of whether it's iMessage or SMS, you can just do it all from the messages app on your Mac, which is really handy. However, um, mine were all set and all turned on here and they would not appear. So what uh, I, I tried turning it off here and turning it back on that didn't solve it. What did solve it, and I've done on all three of these Macs that it was happening on and has now fixed it, is I go into messages on the Mac, I go into accounts, and I choose the iMessage account. You may have more than one account in there. In fact, on this computer, I still have an AIM account logged in, so I'm going to go ahead and disable that because AIM is gone. <laughs> um, but go to iMessage and un it choose sign out disabling the account did not work. So I choose sign out completely sign out. I, I quit messages and relaunched it. Um, I signed back in and then I was able to launch that text message forwarding section on the iOS settings. It, the computer was listed there, but it was off. Turn it on. Everything worked. So, um, so there you go. That's uh, I can't believe I'm the only one that's been going through this. So hopefully that, uh, That'll fix. I don't think you are forward. because I just went to my text message forwarding screen on my iPhone, Dave. Yeah. And, um, two of my three devices were not even invited to the party. So. Yeah. They get, you got to just <laughs> log them out and log them back in. There you go. Yep. Oh, or just turn the feature oh. on. It's oh, I see. Me. They're listed there. There's just not turned on. Yeah. So the first time that you turn it on, what will happen is the device that you've turned on, like if, if I turn on iMac Studio, because that's what I call the iMac in the studio. If it's mm -hmm. the first time, the iMac in the studio will then display a series of numbers that you have to confirm on your phone so that you're not yes. just, you know. And it's saying that right now. It's like, yeah, your iPad, which is downstairs. There uh, you go. It's telling, and it's like, uh, yeah, not now. Yeah, not so now. We'll do right. Later. We'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that way it, it confirms that you own the device or you have the device in your possession and you're, you, you're truly authenticating this and not just accidentally turning it on. So, um, so there you go. That's that quick tip. Um, you want to, let, let's go to Mary here and then we've got a slew of quick tips. Actually, you know what, before we go to Mary, I want to take a minute. And thank all of our premium subscribers uh, that contributed for the week. Um, Amy W. Was in for a one-time contribution of a hundred bucks. Amy, you rock. She actually emailed me with a question um, and then emailed me a, about 45 minutes with the, later and said, oh, thankfully I figured it out. And I think her question was similar to similar to, to what we're going to talk about. It was, it was about photos and salvaging things. Um, and then, and then, um, and then Amy contributed to the show. So thank you for that, Amy. Uh, on the monthly $10 plan, we have Clive S, Everett T, David G, Jeff F, Joseph B P, John B, and Tony Z. Uh, thank you to all of you. And then on the biannual $25 every six-month plan, we have Andrew the Computer Guy. We have Gary R, David H. Not me, uh, although mine did come through this this time too. I, I pay ten dollars a month actually to us, John, to make sure that the system works. So there you go. Um, wow. Yeah, you know. Uh, but this is a different. You're welcome. This is a different David H. Um, Fernando F, Daniel H, Lyndon N, Michael E, Andrew S, Royce T, Lee F for fifty dollars every six months, uh, and James H. So there you go. So yes, all of you, thank you. And uh, as I just mentioned, you're all in good company because I'm i uh, I'm a premium subscriber too. <laughs> there you go. Um, if you want to find out about all of that, MacKeekup.com slash premium will open that door and head you down that path. If, uh, if you are able and interested, and if you are not able or not interested, if either of those is true, that's totally Okay. Please keep listening, keep uh, sending in your questions like that's really important and uh, and visit our sponsors. As I said last time, just just visit. That's what we ask. If you wind up buying something from great, that's you know, it, it's on them to convince you to buy. It's on us to convince you to visit. So there you go. 
that's that's that, there are those are all the ways you can help us out now john take us to mary if you would please mary writes and says hi dave slash john <laughs> that's us believe it uh, that's us yeah i guess believe it or not i have yet to take the all-important step of migrating my aperture library to photos i'm looking to take the scary plunge imminently however I'm on Mac OS Sierra and wanted to know whether Power Photos would help me do this, which I suspect it will. The problem is, I have painstakingly organized with an S and not a Z, so you can figure out. Something. So she might she might be from the UK, across the pond, as yeah. we call it. We both call it. I think. Well, I was going to um, say if if you're in the UK, it's not across the pond. We're across the pond, so you know. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. So um, so painstakingly organize my photos into folders and projects. And I need to know whether the structure will be maintained when power photos migrates to the library as they are a sponsor. I wondered if you could get confirmation of this. Um, I think they're on our sponsor page. Um, also, have either of you been through the process yourselves? And if so, are you able to provide any tips? Your help will be appreciated. And my tip, Dave is yes. Among the abilities of power photos is that it can help migrate your iPhoto or Aperture library. And I think what it does is it just provides a, a little more level of detail as to the progress of the operation from what I can see of their description. So I don't okay. think it does anything different. So I'm going to venture, Dave, that you may not, not want to involve Power Photos to do this because my experience, Dave, and I'm not sure about yours, my experience was the Apple migration process was more than adequate and huh. it migrated the items that I wanted migrated. And the, and the thing is, uh, so what Mary brings up is very important is that if you spend all this time to make albums or folders or projects, and I think those are most of the entities that people group things into when they use either iPhoto or aperture, the migration, at least for me, worked fine. Uh, some were called something different, but the thing is it, it, it brought the entity over along with all the, 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 the work that I did. That's so, good. Um, yeah. I mean, Apple has a great article about this called updating from iPhoto and aperture to photos for Mac OS. Um, the other advantage though, is that if you use Apple's migration method, guess what? What? You save a ton of disk space because Apple does this magic as far as I can tell, this is still the case here. And they have another article called Photo Saves Disk Space by Sharing Images with Your iPhoto or Aperture Libraries. So what it does is it uses these things, I think, these mysterious entities, Dave, called symbolic links. Or hard links. Or hard links. Yeah. So what happens is that right. even though it makes a new photos library, it's not, even though you look at it and the size of it says it's big, or as big as your prior library, it's not actually taking up that amount of space. Uh, yep. Yep. That makes sense. And I found this. If you do it on the same volume, that's a APFS volume and not a network volume. If you do the migration, you will not in reality, take up any additional disk space, which I think is what you want. Once you add photos, of course, yes, then you will take up more disk space. Um, so I'm going to say the, the power photos feature that, monitors this process may be, may be useful, but I see no problem with giving Apple's option a shot. And I think you'll be happy. And then if anything doesn't turn out the way you want, then you may want to dive into the power photos pool uh, to help, you know, segment your library or, you know, it's great for that. But I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I, I don't see it a necessary participant in the migration process but fair enough yeah i've used afterwards, it afterwards maybe yeah i've used it quite a, i've used power photos quite a bit to migrate iphoto libraries over but more recently that's people that have drives full of old iphoto libraries and old photos libraries and they want to consolidate it all together into one library for um, you know, iCloud photo library or whatever. And most of these cases, they have no idea which photos were from what. So by doing all of this with power photos, you get not only power photos migrating them for you, but it 
will do the duplicate detection and prevention, which can right. make life like if you're merging. I, I, I've just had a couple of clients recently, including one down in Austin and one actually down the street mm -hmm. that have had like seven different libraries that you just need to, they just want consolidated. And it's like, yeah, if power photos didn't exist, like you wouldn't be able to afford the time it would take me to do this job. And also right, I wouldn't do, do this job. Yeah, exactly. It would be awful. I mean, yep. you could be painstakingly sitting there. Okay. Between this state and this state and this event. And this, oh. oh no. Well, I'm, I mean, photos has its own duplicate detection, but the problem is merging libraries together. Mm, not really, man. Like power photos is, is, is like it's the shortest money you could possibly spend to get that job done. Yep. And, and they're not actively sponsors, but I think the deal still works. So if you go to fatcatsoftware.com slash MGG, uh, I think you save, I think it's like 20%. It's, it's pretty significant. So uh, it worked a couple of weeks ago when, when I, I did it with a sponsor. So uh, or with a client, not a sponsor. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, there you go. Yeah. I would say give it a go with the built-in tools. Yep. Um, if not, then hey, you get a deal, and you can uh, uh, refine the results of of the uh, migration. Yeah. But I, I found that it was it, it works surprisingly well, Dave, and that nothing, I believe you. Yeah, nothing went wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well. What have we here? What we have here? No, that's a different movie. What we have here is... No, no. We know. Yeah. We can communicate, though, because oh. um, we talked in episode 701 oh, about... Uh, it's true that Cashfly does help us communicate. That, that, that is, that's I very true. Everybody. I like that. Yeah. Uh, we talked in show 701 about the importance of saving, finding out, and then saving your serial numbers because of this weird issue I went through with Apple support. By the way, that iPhone for my son that I <laughs> gave to Apple or we gave to Apple two and a half weeks ago, the repair never happened. It, like, even though Apple uh, customer relations got involved, it never really, they like, the store was supposed to trigger the repair to to finally happen. They never did. Frankly, I don't even know what happened there because customer relations did what customer relations does. And they said, so wait, okay, get, we'll just ship you, you. replacement. Yeah. We'll just ship you a new iPhone. Like we'll deal with so this problem internally. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Which is what would have happened anyway. Like that's how this problem would have been solved was the replacement. The store just gummed up the process somehow. Anyway, um, it's important to know your serial numbers and that might have saved me like a couple of days of time with this particular thing. So we have a lot of comments from you folks about just exactly how to do this. So Jacob writes, he says, uh, I'm sure I am, but one of many, and it's true, uh, to bring this to your attention, but a good place to look for serial numbers, uh, for your devices is at apple ID .apple the device has to have been signed into your Apple ID in some way for it to show up. Um, the devices section is where to look for this stuff. The same information can also be seen on an iOS device that is signed into the account by going to settings, tap on your name, and then scroll down. So thank you, Jacob. That is a good way to get that stuff for sure. For sure. Uh, anything to add to that before I go to the next person that, uh, that, that talks about all of this stuff, Mr. Braun? I don't know if I have a fish shake yet. Okay. Do I? I don't know. Do I? Wait. I'll go to I'll go to sound? Corbett. How's that sound? Okay. I'll I'll, I'll uh you'll, start you'll contemplate your you'll you'll, you'll start you warm start warming up the fist. <laughs> okay. Uh, Corbett then writes similar topic and says, "Amazing." Uh, go to check warranty that displays your serial number as well. And he said it even worked on my iPhone that was powered down. Uh, my guess is it was not reading from a powered down iPhone. It was reading from its cache of the information that it saved about your iPhone because that's what iMazing will do. But that's a great way because if you had sent the phone off, if, if uh, Lucas had backed up that phone with iMazing, we would have had that data there, which is which is also pretty good. But even better is Donna who comes in with a great idea. Donna says, I'm sure there's a better way to do this, but 
I created an Apple contact in contacts and I enter all of my Apple product serial numbers in the notes section of that contact. I also have the phone numbers of Apple care, my local Apple stores and general number uh, saved in here. Plus email addresses for Tim cook and the one to report phishing to emails to for Apple. This works for me and has actually helped me out many times. And, uh, and she just, you know, sent us a, a screenshot that hid her serial numbers, just showing how it all works. She said, I often sell my old devices to friends and family. So I move them down to the end and just keep the serial numbers for a while in case anyone should happen to need one. And she puts those in parentheses and lists who she sold it to or gave it to or whatever. So very cool, Donna. Uh, I like that idea. I, I think you either should put them there. I like the contacts record, but uh, because it's synced with iCloud and it's all there. Or if you're using something like uh, one password or RoboForm or, you know, LastPass or something like that, then you could um, you could store them in a note there, too. But save them somewhere. It'll pay off down the road. So there you go. And that and that starts our quick tip section for the day. Do you have anything to add? Are you going to shake your fist or should I move on to the other quick? Tips yeah, no. Uh, so the fist shake is that in the last episode, if you recall, we were talking about ways to get your serial number. You know what way you shouldn't use, Dave? What is logging into your iCloud account? Because even though it lists your devices, like I indicated, if mm. you click on them, it only shows the last five digits of the serial number. Right. Why? So iCloud. Whereas if you log into Apple ID, Big as indicated, up. it shows you the entire serial number. In addition to doing what I've now concluded is kind of lame two factor authentication because, dude, it's not two factor authentication. Right, 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 right. When I notice that I log into the page and it's like, all right, well, you're on this page on the same device. So let me give you, you know, type in these numbers. And I'm like, well, dude, how's that helping? Yeah. Dude, I don't know. I'm maybe I'm not understanding their definition of two factor. No, it's two step, not two factor. Uh, yeah. Anyways, correct. but the thing that's is, right. why do they show the entire serial number if I log into AppleID.com, but not if I log into my iCloud account, which shows the exact same devices being logged into that account? You might be logged into your iCloud I, account doing other things, like you might have your calendar up or your contacts up or your photos or whatever. And whereas I mean, no, I'm on, I'm, I'm on iCloud.com no, 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 and it no. doesn't show the full, you're not listening. I'm on app, L okay. Let me say this a different Speak. way. Okay. You might be logged into your iCloud account to do other things like visit mm -hmm. your contacts or check your calendar, like work type stuff, like general day to day Ooh. type stuff. So for right. that reason, Apple may have chosen to obscure the full serial numbers here just in case someone happens to sit down at your computer while you're logged into iCloud. Whereas if you log into Apple ID .apple .com, like you are going to, you are going there to mess with your account in a very deep mm -hmm. way. And so I think, I think it's just a security thing. They, they, they figure iCloud, you might be logged in more generally. And so they, they just want to protect you. So yeah. You I'll, I'll, I'll throw you a bone on that. All right. There you go. This or it could time. just be inconsistent. And there you go. It's just how it, it is. Just be yeah. A yeah. UX disaster. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, I, I stumbled onto a thing this week. Actually, one of the guys that, uh, that works for me, Jeff Q had, uh, you know, he had just one of those eye exams that you have and it messes with your vision for a couple hours. Cause that's, you know, how those goes. Those go. drops. Yeah. 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 And he's like, yeah. hey, you know, I, I have some stuff to do. I've got some some deals closing. He's like, you know, is there any way he's like, I know I can zoom in in my web browser, but can I zoom in in mail or, or do anything else? And uh, and I said, well, yeah, it, because you can zoom anywhere you want. In fact, you can zoom the whole screen if you need to. Uh, first, you have to go to system preferences, accessibility and check the box that says zoom with control scroll like that's the important first step. And then once you've done that uh, and it's it, it, sorry, it's system preferences, accessibility, zoom. Uh, and then uh, depending on your your um, which operating system, but it's the use scroll gesture with modifier keys to zoom. You're going to choose control and then you can hold down the control key 
and use the scroll button on your mouse. Or if you have a trackpad, you do the, the two finger swipe up or down and that will scroll you in or out on the screen and it follows your cursor around and it doesn't mess with anything. It doesn't jump your windows around. It doesn't change your font sizes. It just literally zooms you in on the screen. Super handy for a lot of things. Uh, I've done it to get better screenshots on stuff because when you zoom in, uh, you sometimes, you know, you can get a better screenshot and that sort of thing. So, so there you go. That's, uh, that's one quick tip I have to share. Do you have anything to add to that before I share my other one, John? Go. Um, on your, I, I had a smart mailbox that it's actually for our Mac Geek Gab premium folks. I, I say anything that like all the Mac Geek Gab premium stuff I have, um, like for, for when, when your, your payments come in so that I can, I can make sure to thank everybody in the show. Um, I have them all come in and filtered into one mailbox. And then I have a smart mailbox that shows me all unread items from that other mailbox so that I can easily see, okay, great. And then I can go there and I just scroll through and then it's done and it's empty and it's good. I had one item that kept floating in that mailbox and it was from like, you know, March 2nd or something. I had already read it. It was not marked as unread, uh, but it kept it reappearing in that mailbox. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I went to the source mailbox, the one that actually has the messages and I went to the mailbox menu and I chose rebuild in mail and that solved the problem. So because what that does is it rebuilds the index for that mailbox and it's the index upon which everything else like smart mailboxes and search and everything else relies. So there was something wrong with the index for that particular mailbox. I surgically struck at it and replaced just that index by going to mailbox rebuild index and boom or mailbox rebuild i guess it doesn't say rebuild index but that's what it's doing is rebuilding the index and it's been fine ever since so that's another little tip to uh to share quick tips that's why we do them good yeah look at you surgically almost like a doctor All, almost doctor. like a doctor but as far like as doctor. you know he's not a real doctor remember that that's, important. that's what i say that's what i say that's right. Uh, and then back to Daryl. And because Daryl's audio comment earlier sounded so good with the cool stuff found, we're going to do it again. So take it away, Mr. Daryl. Hey, John and Dave. This is Daryl with a quick tip that I ran into if anyone runs into something similar on their Apple Watch. I was at the coffee shop having a chat with a neighbor, then getting a bunch of text messages from my family members through messages when I noticed all of the names were being replaced with phone numbers in a gradual basis. Then uh, figured quickly that it was probably an iCloud sync issue, went and uh, poked around on a bunch of different things, and finally discovered the solution, thanks to an article at uh, uh, Mac Observer. I have to actually go on the phone using the watch app and do a force resync there. And that did fix everything and brought it all back. Now, by the way, this is being recorded from the Apple Watch. Your Apple Watch microphone sounds really good, man. Like, I, I'm really impressed with that. But that's that's a great little reminder. And we've talked about that in the show. In fact, it was a MGG Answers article on Mac Observer, which takes stuff we talk about in the show and puts it uh, out on the website. So, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a handy little tip because it happens sometimes. I see it happen uh, so there you go. We'll link to that article, of course, because, you know, we know those guys. Uh, any thoughts on that before we go to Steven here, John? Mm, no. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to go on about caller ID spoofing, but, um, which is this, this isn't quite that. That's so not that. Yeah. That for okay. Later. Okay. Um, Stephen writes, he said, I'm not sure if something similar has been mentioned by anyone else on MGG, but I have a photos tip. I like to have my photos organized with an S in case you're counting at home, John. Uh, I like to have my photos organized in albums. So I have created a smart album named unorganized. The rule for which is album is not any. I can then select photos from there and create a new album in a normal way. File new album with selection. Those photos will then be removed from the unorganized smart album 
thus just showing the photos not contained within a normal album. He said, I have other smart albums for each of the cameras I've owned and for each year of taking digital photos, et cetera, et cetera. I like this idea because that's a it's similar to my my smart mailbox with the unread stuff. It compartmentalizes these things that you, you need to deal with. And then it's empty when you're finished dealing with it. Really, really great tip, man. I like that. That's uh, that's that's good. I'm going to do that. And then it's, it's going to make me organize all my photos, which is good. It's a good general tip, which I see. <clears throat> so I like taking pictures. Most people do. I wouldn't say I'm a professional photographer, though I occasionally well, you, take pictures. You that could say you're a prote- professional photographer if people have paid you for your pictures. And I think we at TMO have published your pictures that we've paid for. And so semi, uh, let's say semi pro. All right. But um, one of the challenges that I've seen among uh, and, and a lot of our Mac brethren um, are also in photography. And the thing is, the one thing that I've seen, Dave, is deal with your photos immediately after you take them. Otherwise you will wallow in, <laughs> you will wallow in a sea of indecision because yeah, you have totally. so much stuff that you don't know what the hell, what to do with. No, you have to immediately do it. We even, uh, one of the friends in our circle is called Bart and we always called it Barting your photos is that the thing is, whatever you take, you're probably going to chuck about 90% of it because they suck or they're just yeah. not great. Yeah. The thing is, if you do it now, you get rid of the pain. If you wait for tens or hundreds of thousands of photos to accumulate with nothing except a date and timestamp, you're going to be lost. And Deal location with it stamp. Don't don't forget, your photos will have a location stamp. Right, right. Too. You can sort by that. Yes. No, granted. But you're still going to have ones that suck for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Now, you could post-process them or you could just say, you know what? They're lost. I'm just going to delete them. But well, that's kind I, of the nice part that, about that is, moments in photos is it starts to automatically do some of that for you so that you don't have to like yes. organize and, you know, and, and I've actually had it come up. It's like, like, dude, it showed me, <laughs> it was really actually kind of creepy. It's like, Hey, remember that super storm you had like eight years ago? Yeah. Here you go. Here's yeah. your photo. No, it showed me a photo album that I took of the disaster that we had here many years ago called Superstorm Sandy, which was basically oh, yeah, a hurricane a and a flood all back, all bundled into one. And it was a mess. And I took lots of pictures. Mm-hmm. It was like, Hey, you want to see this after two years, <laughs> after all these years, I, I forget the exact number of years, but it was sure. Yeah. yeah, again, yeah, yeah. I think it was seven years, but it was like, eesh. um, not the moment I want to remember. So they may have to work on the album. Yeah. Well, and I've heard, yeah, I've heard it. We've all heard of things being pulled in where it's like, oh yeah. Yeah. No, here's probably that not what you want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And, uh, you, it was, uh, it will, it was five and a half years ago. It'll be six years this year. It was, it was, uh, hurricane Sandy was October of October and November yep. of 2012. So there you go. Yeah. We're still, uh, some people are still rebuilding. Oh, yeah. Uh, the towns in Vermont, I remember, got hammered by that one. It's bad news. And then negotiating with FEMA and the right. government and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, it's just. Yep. It's bad, yeah, man. It's bad. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people lost their here. homes. Yeah. Um, moving. I, I Actually, we have one more cool stuff found, I think. And that really is all we have time for, I think, is uh, is coming in. Real time from Brother Jay in the chat room. John, you happen to Whoa. casually mention caller ID problems. And Brother Jay suggests uh, an app slash service called Trap Call, T R A P C A L L. And uh, when a call comes in without caller ID, uh, you can say no and then Trap Call somehow lets you find out what the number was. It looks pretty magical. Uh, so uh, we'll link to it. Uh, Brother Jay says, I have been subscribed to their ultimate plan for years and I love it. And it also says trap call ultimate. You can record your incoming calls. So think about that. That's very interesting. In addition to state law regarding the recording of telephone conversations and people that approve of such. Well, you want to check into your local, not just state laws, but your, your local laws uh, about all of that, because not everybody lives in the United States. So ah, you know. yes. But yep. I believe in my state, you do not need consent from all parties to record 
a call. Yeah, New Hampshire, you do. Everybody needs okay. to know. Yeah. I just record them anyways, because it's just good practice. I've been recording this call, John. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> I <would> certainly hope so. <laughs> that, yeah, me too. I hope I've been recording it. That's for sure, man. You didn't forget to push the button. Did you? Uh, it doesn't look like it. No, I, I. It would. It would take a lot. I mean, I. I have a keyboard maestro script that starts the recording and resets the timestamp and brings me over to Farago so that I can play the theme music. It like it does all these things. So I, it would have to just malfunction. Is really like yeah. yeah otherwise yeah. Yeah. So Brother Jay enjoyed what I said. And the thing is, uh, when I hear, sometimes when I'm on the phone with people, like especially customer support, and they're like, we're recording this call for quality purposes. And when they got on the line, I'm like, yeah, I just thought you'd like to know that I'm also recording this call for quality purposes. And one of them, don't yeah. know what to make of that statement. A friend of mine, um, <laughs> this, this, I actually, I won't say who his name was, but he probably would love it if I, I did. Know who anyway. it is exactly. No, you don't. No, no, no. This is, I, I, I will oh, say that it was, guy. It, was okay. it was Dennis Powell who ran, uh, this website called Linux and Main for a long time. Uh, and he's, he is a professional photographer, um, uh, and has, has had a great career. But anyway, um, he was telling me once he was, you know, like complaining, to somebody or whatever and they had committed to doing something for him like a customer service rep had committed to doing something for him and then the company wasn't gonna you know g- gonna stand by it they're like well we would never commit to that and uh he's like well i have a recording of the customer service agent you know saying that that you did and they're like uh you were not given permission to record that phone call and he says yeah i was it's in the recording And of course, what he was referring to was the statement that is made often, but not always for customer service calls that says this call may be recorded for quality and training purposes. And it Mm. doesn't say this call may only be recorded by one end for quality and training purposes. It says this call may be recorded, which is, in fact, words of permission. So, mm-hmm. uh, so you know, he played him the recording and then got what he needed. So, so when they say that, are they are they implying that you have permission to record it? Uh, that is exactly how one could interpret that. Yes. <laughs> and 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 with contract law, you know, the person who writes the contract, if the if a contract mm-hmm. is written by only one party, then that party is on the hook to make it as clear as possible. And if there is a, uh, a, a, a discrepancy in the interpretation of the contract, then the discrepancy will always go towards the person, towards the party that did not draft the contract. It's like, wait a minute, you came up with the language. Don't make me take your interpretation of your language. I get right. my interpretation. But to me, of the it, larger so. issue is why do you have an issue with me catching you lying? Right. Well, that's the that's the other problem. Right. That's right. Yeah. Is that yeah, yeah. I was smart enough to catch you lying? Now let's let let's start from that. Let's point. start. Let, let yeah. Can we? Right. Let's let's start from yeah. Exactly. But Dave, I am not going to lie to you when I tell you that we want everyone who hears this to send us an email with good wishes, tips, cookies, um, questions, comments, the whole kitchen sink. You can send us a kitchen sink. I don't know if you can, but if you did, Dave, you would send an email with the kitchen sink to feedback at MackieGab.com. If we get an email from each person that's listening, (laughs) first of all, that would be awesome. Uh, and I would happily <laughs> eventually read through them all, but, but it would take a long time. And it, like, really, truly, it would be fantastic and humbling. So that is feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yes. And once you start the dumpster fire at our email server at feedback at MacGeekGab.com, you can pat yourself on the back. That's right. Thank That's you. right. And as Brother Jay points out, feedback at MacGeekGab.com might or might not also work. But what does definitely work is premium at MacGeekGab.com. And that's for all of you that are premium members. We do prioritize those emails. And I'll tell you what, if everybody listening sends an email to feedback at MacGeekGab.com, you premium folks are going to feel pretty smug knowing that your emails are going to get read first before we have to Mm. 
mm-hmm. to wade through that particular mm-hmm. mire of the uh, of the tens of thousands of emails on the other side. So what else, Dave? You know what else? What's that, John? I'm going to toss it out there. Toss. There's iTunes. There's reviews. You can go there and you can review us. Yeah, in fact, we go to Mac. You for a while. Go to macgeekgab.com slash iTunes to oh. do those reviews. We we get you as close as we can. We can't quite get you there, but go to macgeekgab.com. Well, it's incomprehensible gibberish, right? Um, well, no, it's just like there's no direct link no. Um, possible, but we get you as close as we can. And we really would love it if you left us reviews. It's It helps a ton. So that's it. That's our ask for the week is is go leave us reviews. We're not going to tell you about any other ways to, to find us or anything. MacGeekUp.com slash iTunes will bring you there and you can leave a review right there. Uh, that would be great. We would love that. Very cool. Very cool. All right, John. Um, yes. It I, warms our heart, Dave, when we're on the what's hot. Yeah. For we sure. know we're hot. I, um, I would like to be. I mean, it, this, this, yeah. um, this, 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 this. A space heater has turned off or something <laughs> happened. I don't know. It's starting to get cold again in here, but it was good for a little while, so that was good. So you uh, may need... Dave needs some iTunes reviews. There you go. That's right. To put us in the hot space so he can be warm. That's right. Uh, we told you we thank Cashfly at cashfly.com. I want to thank all of our sponsors, of course, Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Barebones at uh, barebones.com. Roboform.com, coupon code MGG. Ring at ring.com slash MGG. Molecule with a K, coupon code MGG. It's good stuff, folks. Hopefully, you won't be like me, and you'll be able to maintain your temperature and comfort in your home and your office as you wish. And so my wish to you is that you don't get caught. Made on a bat.